Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, uh, and thank you to the keynote speakers, uh, Sarah and Rachel, for their very thought provocative um, interventions. I'll keep my, my response brief because I think uh, we'll get more out of this. Uh, 45 minutes we're going to spend together, an hour we're going to spend together actually listening to Rachel and Sarah uh discuss with each other uh i i saw both of them at each other's uh, uh keynotes i also went to uh several of the other panels i tried to go to as many as i i, I possibly could to also see in ways in which i can connect uh the keynotes to current concerns current projects uh current interests of the community that came together here so we can start with a response. So the thing that was the most challenging for me was uh, also uh, trying to uh, find the intersections between uh, Sarah and Rachel's um, keynotes. I hope that most of you uh, were hopefully there too. They come at the uh, at a critique of AI, uh, and just to clarify, uh, a we are talking about this because of the sort of like uh, media blitz around generative AI, even though the comments by both Rachel and Sarah refer to the long arc of uh, AI uh, technologies that are not necessarily uh, generative AI. So thinking about the intersections, so Sarah is coming at this from the German media uh, uh, studies uh, tradition. So it's uh, her intervention is we could call philosophical uh, or theoretical in the ways that it tries to understand our relationship to computational technologies uh, in general and AI uh, specifically uh, as a tail end to those technologies. In particular, a, a, a concept that I hadn't heard before is a neural media, and, and that is, of course, speaks to my ignorance of uh, the German uh, theoretical tradition uh, around a new media. But we understood the concept, I think, or I think I understood the concept, which is uh, just uh, this kind of media that depends on uh, networks that are mediated by algorithmic uh, machines uh, that we've been familiar with at least since uh, Web 2.0. And of course, Sarah can clarify if I'm misunderstanding the concept of neuro media uh, in a second. Um, and of course, she sees uh, AI, or I understood her to say that, a that the new iteration of AI is a continuation of that tradition. And part of the problem of that tradition is how identities form within those traditions. So in my own interpretation, reading of her comments, what I understood uh, uh, these surface effects of identity uh, as being mediated by neural uh, media, it's basically uh, what I, I, we can understand the effect of a hashtag is. So if uh, I'd say that like the, uh, Hashtag uh, Black Lives Matter unites people either for or against uh, that uh, single computational entity. In a sense, identities are being formed uh, in the process of aligning with these things. And this is the problematic in the sense, of course, that uh, that they're being mediated by machines that we may not understand that very well, or not only machines, let's so we can talk about infrastructures too, because it's not only the machines that enable uh, uh, that uh, uh, these things to happen or the algorithms, the software and the servers that enable these things uh, to happen. But uh, when we say infrastructures, we can also add a little bit of that social element. I mean, uh, we can use that concept that, uh, that it, uh, comes from media studies, uh, socio-technical constructs, right? Uh, so in that sense, uh, AI is participating in this long term. And one of the, one of the dangers there in, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an even uh, points to a longer arc, an arc that uh, some of my people uh, trace back to the enlightenment to Kantian thought, uh, to this idea that man with a capital M 
can be a stand-in for everybody. So, uh, I mean, in, in that sense, at least, I, I do know about that German tradition, uh, the one from the 18th century. And uh, uh, these folks, uh, uh, together with the French and their encyclopedias and their Enlightenment uh, philosophy, kind of gave, gave us an idea of man that was rational, stuff like that. But it's mostly just, you know, like uh, some dude in Königsberg, uh, uh, who said, you know, everybody is like me, except people don't necessarily achieve that level of, of manness as I do, you know, because we, we find this a lot. It's like maybe the Africans could, could work a little harder at being, at, at really being a, a rational uh, man. Uh, and, and of course, there's an universalism that already comes provincialized from the, from the box. And I think this is the way I'm, I understood Sarah is, this, of course, like, we, apparently we haven't overcome this. And apparently San Francisco and, and a lot of the folks uh, uh, who are uh, in control of these technologies that are, that are forced on us, uh, that kind of land on us, like uh, you should pay attention to it, uh, are kind of reliving this moment over and over again. And it behooves us to continue to resist that. So at, at for political uh, reasons. Uh, so. Of course, uh, uh, I, I, whenever I think about the, this moment of generative AI, I think about the long tradition of electronic literature that folks of, that us in the digital humanities were familiar with, because these are our friends. Sometimes we go to the same conferences as they do. And of course, they've been doing chatbots and they've been doing uh, generating electronic text uh, using you know, control flows, uh, if then this, that, uh, before statistically we, uh, we arrived at where we are now, but nobody ever thought, saw them as a danger. Uh, their relationship to, to the technology, to use Sarah's uh, formulation towards the end uh, of, of her talk, was always, uh, we, we thought of it as salutary and as refreshing. It's like, oh, they're going against the mainstream. They're doing a kind of art that is being ignored by the mainstream. And there's always that saintlyhood and charm that is associated to anything that is ignored uh, by the mainstream. And we like them. Uh, it, but they weren't doing something that different. The difference is, though, in the amount of capital, the amount of marketing, the amount of... Uh, leverage power uh, that the people who are doing the latest iteration of generating text and images uh, seem to have. Um, and of course, that brings us to Rachel's comment, uh, which is because of this power and because of this uh, sort of uh, unfair advantage that they have, uh, they actually are affecting things in massive scales in ways that concern us uh, all in the planet. Uh, the environmental cost is, is, is obvious. They're not even denying it. Sam, Sam Altman himself is like, uh, is like aware. It's like, oh, we're going to run out of energy. Uh, we, we better figure out this whole, uh, where we're going to get the, the energy from uh, very soon, right? And it, it's in, in, a, in, in, a, and in a twist of complete lack of self consciousness, uh, I, I think on that first interview when he first acknowledged, he also said, but this is where AI will help us solve that by coming up with solutions. Uh, so it's like narrative poetry will help us solve uh, 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 climate change. Sure, uh, whatever you say, bro. The, the, the impact is immediate. The impact on labor is also visible already to us. I mean, it, to us, I'm not saying it's visible to let's say just the US uh, average a user of ChatGPT does not probably know how the sausage is put together. My, my colleague here at Yale University, Julian Posada is one of many uh, working right now on uh, the doing uh, social scientific work with the communities uh, in um, South America. Others doing uh, uh, this similar work in uh, Asia, South Asia, East Asia. Uh, it's not only the people gathering the data, collecting the data. There's in South America, in particular, uh, we have the crew that actually makes the product uh, safe for American consumption. So a bunch of unpaid, uh, very low, uh, badly paid Venezuelan folks are um, doing the machine learning part of the of the thing, where it's like, uh, yes, this is viol this is a decapitation. Yes, this is porn. Yes, this is. Uh, um, 
inappropriate for children. Yes, this is religiously contentious, etc. Exposed to this uh, violence all day long for very little pay with predictable psychological damage uh, in, the, in the long term. And not many people know about them uh, in the mainstream. And of course, all of this to somebody like me, connecting it a little bit to what Sarah said, is, uh, is trying to uh, uh, just, uh, it's, it's done because of the moral standards of American contemporary society which is a combination of left and right. So the left is not particularly innocent in this. The desire of Americans to be innocent, uh, that is projecting a kind of universalism of what Moors are to the rest of the planet. But the truth is that there are people paying for this morality. There are people paying for, uh, uh, like really, like in, in real life, paying with their souls, their psyches, their well-being. For this, uh, for Americans to to have a product that is safe and that doesn't offend them. Uh, now, labor and the environment, and and also in racial stock, is also political power that is implied. Uh, now, it's not only AI. For example, a, a clear example of how things are getting really weird is how Elon Musk, through his control of satellites, is uh, is determining wars and like the future of political organization in the planet just by giving you access including including holding leverage over the pentagon in the united states which i find astonishing uh, uh and with ai it will be similar right now we heard yesterday that the saudis are about to invest that want to invest 40 billion dollars into uh generative ai i don't know if you guys were paying attention to the news uh yesterday but this, uh, the, the, the Saudis in, in their attempt at uh, diversifying their portfolio and uh, taking their eyes off of their own uh, human rights abuses in uh, Saudi Arabia are, are want to be the biggest player in generative AI. Now the hope I think uh, Rachel gives us is, uh, and this came up a little bit also in the question and answer uh, in Rachel's talk, the hope is that we can, uh, leverage citizenry, grassroots uh, movements, organization from the ground to push political, uh, uh, to, to push our various nation states and uh, transnational collaborations to, uh, to have an impact on policy that can rein in control the worst excesses of this thing. Uh, I, 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 Obviously, the last thing you lose is hope, and of course, I, I, I encourage everybody to to get involved in, at whatever level they can in these kinds of things, so that we can protect our environment, protect labor conditions uh, uh, everywhere. Not all nation states in the planet are democratic, uh, meaning that these decisions are outside of the hands of the people that are the subjects of many of these nations. Um, but you know, still something we can work. Where I'm speaking from a democratic uh, society, still that uh, where where our voices do have a little bit of an impact. Uh, it's torn right now between the fascists and uh, the other guys. I don't know where to put an adjective on that. Uh, now we still though can can have an impact here. Now my. My reconciliation of these two came right now, you just saw it, in the form of a trajectory from one to the other. My first question to, and, and by, and way, by way of like butchering their talk, by synth, their different talks, by synthesizing them uh, as much as I could, they, I, I invite them to disagree with my characterization of their comments. Uh, but, my challenge to them is to see, uh, uh, not a challenge, I mean, my, my question, my first question to them is how do they see the connection? I, I take both things they're saying to be, to be true. I, I, I see the problem with, universal, with, with the universalism being infiltrated in these relationships to technology that, that, that we have. And I obviously see the political, uh, 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 environmental and labor problems that AI uh, brings uh, to the table and how we should resist them. Uh, I, my first question to them is, how do they, how do they listen to each other's uh, uh, 
we'll keep going after that. Well, I'll ask you a couple more questions. Let's start, let's start there. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. Um, Rachel, I don't know if you want to begin or if, um, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I can, I can maybe start um, by saying or talking about some of the connections that I actually saw. And uh, I mean, this is something that I did actually um, on the, uh, mute of my messaging apps. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of connections that I saw with regards to what Rachel presented, first of all, thank you so much, Rachel, for your wonderful um, contribution, because I thought that actually um, it was a beautiful, it resonated quite beautifully with the things that I was trying to say, because what I didn't actually say in my talk, um, but which is kind of like a foundational uh, understanding that I carry with me when I when I think about these things and when I think about identity in particular, is that it is uh, definitely connected to more material forms of distributing uh, access. And this is access to not only the technology itself, but also to the kind of more general surround, right? So access to land. If we think about where uh, we've heard how, uh, where certain uh, raw materials are extracted to build these uh, technologies, right? So we've heard about, um, lithium and all of these things that are predominantly found or predominantly extracted in uh, the DRC in Congo, in Nigeria, and in other places in Africa, in other countries in Africa. Um, and then also perhaps to just point out that Silicon Valley itself is uh, built on indigenous land and was and kind of followed a genocidal um, history of removing people from that land after which, you know, um, Silicon Valley and the people uh, that built it could kind of uh, posit themselves as a counterculture that would then go on to kind of, you know, uh, bring a new uh, sense of a digital identity that, I mean, if we, I don't know if you're all familiar with John Perry Barlow's uh, Declaration of Independence of the Internet, um, there he very much used this kind of uh, colonial or what Eve Tuck and Kei Wen Yang call um, kind of uh, this pacification of, of settler identity in the sense of that they kind of styled themselves as the new um, new free world in a sense, uh, which could happen digitally precisely because it is disembodied. And I think that another intersection that I perhaps did not over articulate in my talk is that, that but that I see uh, resonate with what Rachel was saying is that actually what I want to kind of stress is that techno technologies are always already embodied, right? Be it by, uh, the bodies that create these technologies uh, or that uh, train the data and so often uh, and so on oftentimes in very um, menial uh, labor conditions, labor conditions that are not accepted as labor conditions um, and then also working under dangerous or oftentimes uh, very repressive kind of um, uh, situations. Um, so I, so I think like uh, what came out in Rachel's talk as well was this idea of technology not just being the object or so not just the, the kind of uh, very limited software or hardware, or, or, but also like a wider system that it, uh, that it acts in, be it the, the extraction of the raw minerals, but also the, the labor uh, environments uh, in which people build the AI and so on and so forth. And, and then in the end also how people use it. And I think in each and every one of these, um, moments uh, you can kind of uh, frame questions of identity and connect them to the material um, reality of that very moment. So for example, um, I'm thinking of people like Lisa Nakamura who has pointed out that you know uh, hardware in the 80s and 90s was predominantly constructed by uh, women and very often on indigenous land precisely because it was cheaper to build factories there, microchip factories and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there, those that I think is like the the strongest connection that I see in the sense of thinking about technology as something that is actually very very much embodied and quite contrary to the narratives of uh, Sam Altman and Elon Musk and so on and so forth who kind of projected this image of technology as something that is um, more right or that is has more uh, insight into how the world works uh, because it is disembodied or because it can be everywhere at the same time when actually we see in the reality that for example people who are training data have to kind of rely on 
um, you know, preformed concepts, taxonomies, and so on and so forth to train the data and to train an algorithm in a way that is then perceived as correct by the overseers and the overseers are, are um, obviously um, not the African refugees or um, Romanian women staying at home or whoever else is training the data at the moment. So, um, so I think that that's a very, very, uh, that's just a point that I very much resonate with that I've been working on a lot. And I think another thing that I thought was really, really important that you said, Rachel, was the point of the, the not only that there is a very, very strong kind of, you know, new form of labor, new form of, of making labor invisible and, and understanding labor as something that kind of disappears in this narrative, but uh, actually also that the relationships, I think Rachel, you said, said that the relationships between the workers are broken down. So the very fact that people are kind of separated and no longer in the same spaces in itself already is something that uh, segregates. And as I say in my monograph, modulates these relationships in the sense of that it creates these, that it creates them not as together or as relational or as a, even being in solidarity with each other, but as actually quite apart. So um, I think that we can talk uh, more and more about uh, how the effects, I think, yeah, how the effects of the material actually work on what I proposed, which was this kind of renewed uh, universal man figure that, that emerges again, or that kind of uh, doesn't really allow for much um, deviation from that norm, so to speak, that sets this norm as as a desirable norm as well, um, and speak about the kind of, I don't know, dark underbelly uh, parallel uh, moment in which, you know, many, few and few, few, less and less people are actually benefiting from these technologies while more and more people are actually kind of made to be the, the reproductive labor force that is kind of also hidden away from and doesn't get to even access these technologies or use them on on an on an on a daily basis or in the same way that that people in the west but also elites in the global south are using them so i think yeah to me that was the that was a very very um a, a connection that was more articulated rachel in your talk and less so in mine but um which is definitely it's definitely something that kind of is the the underbelly to to how i think about or how i theorize identity in the digital and I guess I also, I mean, we're thinking, I, I understand that we're thinking about um, implementation and so on and so forth. So another thing that I thought was really interesting was to see that you, Rachel, on the one side, work with AI yourself and are actually implementing it on a practical level. So this desire to uh, perhaps participate is there, but at the same time, I think that what happens usually when um, you have, because you, Alex and you, you, you I, I don't know if I understood you correctly, but you have you um, just mentioned this, what I understood as a kind of duality or a binary between the desire to participate and the own logics that one potentially brings into the computational system. And I think that very often the modes of resistance can also look like a desire to participate, but I believe that there is also something else going on. So I think this is this is where close reading or like a close analysis of a certain situation comes in. So I guess um, beyond hearing <laughs> perhaps your, um, your resonances or the things that you thought were kind of interesting to think together, I would also like to hear a little bit more, maybe Rachel, if you if you have some examples or if you can talk a little bit more about these own logics and because I think very often what you what what people are doing differently is very often only noticeable in nuance and not so much in the broader narrative of how these uh, projects are potentially presented or even what they do. Um, yeah, but I do know of many, many AI projects that actually are more sustainable, for example, because they don't um, scale upwards, right? Or because they have like a certain very um, directional uh, mode of implication, while AGI as this phenomenon or as this dream is kind of this proposition that it can be everywhere and um, can sort of, yeah, I don't know. Uh, grow in scale to kind of encompass the whole world and then we'll have this, I don't know, pacified space. I don't know, yeah. 
Sarah, thank you so much. I think um, both you and Alex have, have given a lot of um, important things uh, to, to consider and think about. I think from my perspective, we are looking at very similar problems, um, but writing about them in different ways. I must say that um, when I kind of began my work as a scholar, in this area, I, I'd written an article on what does it mean to decolonize AI, where a lot of those um, themes that you were talking about in terms of the production and utilization and commercialization of forms of identity, uh, find continuation from those that were created out of systems of coloniality. And I think that remains one of the core and central challenges. Decoloniality is, you know, twofold about trying to understand what forms of colonial oppression continue to exist, but the major form of that is racism. And so how forms of racism continue, or forms of race, because even the idea of race is peculiar and was, was generated and produced, but how they continue to be put to work formalized, distributed, and depoliticized through these AI systems is something that I am really interested in. And I, I really enjoyed listening to the ways in which you argued and articulated some of those kind of issues around the return of the universal man. I, I, I generally think that the idea of artificial intelligence is, is that it is this kind of sense that a Western framing of the world, and I think this is well represented in generative AI technologies that take the Western framing of the world as captured in the archive of the internet, and then the Western kind of rationalization and superior intel idea of intelligence, that it can be abstracted and then made to function Will be relevant for everyone everywhere is is very much a kind of continuation in a different way of of that of of that idea that you're talking about um yeah so just just to kind of maybe talk a little bit about where where i kind of moved from i i i don't kind of work in the ai practice and technology development space i i work with a lot of african policymakers and developing AI policies and policy responses and strategies. So I came to a point where I had to find a new language um, that could persuade decision makers that the ways in which AI was operating within the world were not serving everybody. And going to those kind of material questions um, just became so kind of visceral and, and stark. And uh, and 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 I think you know, Alex, you've spoken about how we've become increasingly aware of some of these labour issues, and I think that you know it's taken it's taken people aback because AI is presented as this kind of abstract thing in the abstract ether of the cloud, and it's so far removed from people living on indigenous land that are looking for water or a safe meal to eat. Um, and, and so that became my kind of real area of interest was how do I kind of show and articulate this enormous gap, this enormous gap. I must say today I was at a talk because Nick Clegg came to the University of Pretoria here in South Africa. I don't know if this is a public session. Is it a public session? Yes, it is. Anyway, I think that the point I'm trying to make is that we continue to be bombarded by a rhetoric that says this technology will serve everyone everywhere and we just need to catch up. And I think, you know, obviously that's problematic in, in various ways because catching up is, is simply not possible with the amount of money and capital it takes. But secondly, the result of the future that will engender is this material manifestation of that universal man or that universal idea that the Enlightenment first brought about in a far more perfect way 
it it actually represents this kind of totalitarian um, completion of the Enlightenment project. These technologies have suddenly found a way to do it and to complete the project of, of colonialism. And I think that that is something that we need to take action against. I'm really interested, Alex, I'm glad you raised it, about how we talk about resistance. Um, because I think what AI is doing very, 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 very well is blocking efforts, practices, processes and passages of decolonization. So shadow banning tweets and videos that are shared from Palestine um, is perhaps a good example of, of some of those ways in which that happens. But other ways are this individualization of the value chain of AI's production so that one gig worker interacts only with a, a machine and an algorithm and never with his human peer. Um, and, and I find those deeply problematic, but I think we should be very careful to recognize that resistance in this day and age, almost anywhere, meaningful resistance that has a political impact, not just a kind of closed impact within a particular sphere, is dependent on digital forms of networking. And I'm not sure that that's escapable, uh, or not certainly at this stage. Um, so I don't have answers to some of these questions, but I am so interested in how we start to talk about them. And I remain interested in how we find ways to say, you know, if you're sitting with a policymaker and a decision maker that has the ability to write policies and write kind of provisions. And I don't think that and I said, think I said this last night, I don't think good policy making comes from the kind of articulation of international norms. But when there are those opportunities, how do we take them? How do we best use them? Um, and, you know, is it continuing to talk about labour practices and fair labour practices? Is it continuing to say that we need to look at the full value chain? Is it that we say we need global governance because these issues are so interdependent and interrelational that even if Kenya establishes the best practices on labour or whatever, the issues are not going to be fixed as a whole, but then we're presented with this kind of deeply um, fractured global sphere. <laughs> um, and some of these questions, as Alex, you said, become so kind of interconnected with Tesla kind of coming to a halt because of what happened in Yemen. Um, you, you know, this, this thing is planetary. We do live on one world and one planet. And what happens here does have an impact there. And who pays the price for us having, you know, that clean and safe technology, as you describe, is paid by someone. But we are still compassionate, caring human people that want to do better by the people that we share a world with. And I think many people are asking for, okay, what do we do? What can we do? Um, um, and how can we build communities where we can share ideas of, of, of moving forward in a better way? So yeah, I will, I will pause there, but just, just to, you know, obviously, thank, thank, thank the all organisers. I've got better internet now because I'm in an airport, having had my lovely chat with the people that was this morning's conversations. Thank you, Rachel. There's so much I want to talk about, but at least I want to make sure that we uh, continue to talk. Uh, at least have a chance to talk about two things specifically that have come up, uh, and it will, resistance being uh, one of them, and. Uh, the other one being the role of AI within the higher education sector uh, uh, globally. Now, because I do also want to give it an opportunity, at least for audience members, to be able to uh, ask you two questions now that you're together on uh, on the screen. I'm going to try to combine that question of resistance with the question of higher ed, just so that we can knock it out of the park easily solve that problem and, and just uh, uh, one Q&A session. 
the one of the things that, that that I admit to myself begrudgingly is how astonishing it is that generative AI is able to produce the kind of sentences that it does, um, regardless of the fact that yes, they do sound like uh, like Ned Flanders, uh, like from the Midwest in the United States, because uh, there's a new man. It's not from Königsberg anymore. It's from Ohio. The the at least in English the. Th that fact is philosophically interesting. Uh, it, uh, as my colleague and friend Ted Underwood uh, pointed out, this actually uh, vindicates post-structuralist work, Foucault, Derrida, and Parthas, who were always saying language doesn't come from the brain necessarily. It comes, you know, from it's, it's an aggregate of uh, of society. And of course, statistics now allow us to to demonstrate this uh, painstakingly uh, to be evident. Uh, with enormous of uh, cost, obviously. And of course, there's a, a small gold rush within certain sectors of digital humanities to try to figure out, at least for the humanities, in what ways uh, uh, we can use uh, this latest uh, uh, version of AI in order to you know, help us with research, come up with new methods that will, uh, that, that will allow us to answer some research questions that, that, that have dogged us uh, for a while. And that's just one example. There's tons of people around here in higher ed trying to figure out how AI is going to affect this discipline, this field, or this practice. In language departments, people are very anxious about the fact that now some departments are trying to use AI chatbots to, to co have conversations with students when uh, outside of the time that they themselves can have uh, to, to have these conversations. So we see obviously a lot of this pressure to use AI is coming from the administrators who they wanna, don't wanna be left behind. And it's the kind of weird psychological phenomenon with like, like a self-fulfilling prophecy where, where it says this is important, but it's mostly because I'm performing it's important. And they're, and they're, and, and, pushing down the, the hierarchy so that everybody is now, every department is being asked to think about how this is going to be used uh, in higher ed. So there's that side of it, right? Where we're in the, in the, there's a desire to participate to use uh, Cyrus, uh, 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 but it, that is tainted by also a pressure to participate. And it's perhaps hard to disentangle uh, from that. And, and we are in that ecosystem right now in higher ed. At the same time, higher ed seems to propose at least one form of doable resistance. So, not every, uh, Rachel, I salute you that you have access to policymakers in, in several African uh, countries. Uh, but most of us don't, definitely most of us in this room don't, but we do have access to, you know, our internal politics at the university. It's different levels of influence within our own higher ed operations. And this is where the possibility of at least, you know, uh, an account most of us can agree on in higher ed might lead to some resistance. I mean, at, universities still play an important role, uh, despite Sam Altman and Elon Musk and a bunch of others, uh, idea, uh, inclu and Bill Gates, uh, idea uh, about how they are more important than we are in the production of knowledge. I, I would disagree with that assessment of the situation. I still think we play a crucial role in the production of knowledge planetarily. Uh, and that we have not lost as much authority as, as, as some would argue, I, I don't think. So perhaps there is some forms of resistance that we can come up with within uh, higher ed. And I don't think, I suspect that we cannot, that those probably won't be the politics of refusal, right? So politics of refusal is something that a lot of my colleagues participate in. I see a lot of young people be very attracted to the politics of refusal, which is basically saying, I'm just not gonna use it. I'm just not gonna participate. I'm out of the conversation, you can me out. Uh, this is a lot, goes in line with that. I'm not gonna vote. Uh, I, refuse, I refuse to be tainted uh, by this. I don't think that's the way, I, of course, I. Uh, uh, you please disagree with me if you think politics of refusal is, is the only thing left for us to do. Uh, I'm still open to it. Uh, but if we don't choose the politics of refusal, if we are going to participate in creating these systems, 
there's a lot of things that we have to negotiate. And then using the African example, for example, about that, of this panel I was talking about with Sarah, that you were there, Rachel, in Ghana, where, where the two other linguists, one from Senegal and one from Cameroon, were like, but we want to create you know, uh, language models based on our languages. Uh, uh, we want to be a part of, of this game. We're going to be caught in that moment, uh, that ambiguity between desire to participate and pressure to participate for a while. So within that, in the higher ed, how do you, Sarah and Rachel, see possibilities of resistance? I know it's hard. I'm asking you the question, I don't have an answer for it. But, uh, but Hopefully we can think about some together. Um, Ray, uh, so let's start with Rachel and then go to Sarah so that we flip the, yeah. So I, I really love this publication. <laughs> um, I'll start practically and then I'll move to the whimsical. <laughs> we really need research and evidence that shows and, uh, and, and measures and convinces that AI is having harmful impacts across the world. Um, we need that urgently. Um, so I think that universities and systems of knowledge have uh, a crucial role to play there. We need critique and critical thought because we are still struggling to articulate the, the complexity. We will continue to, but we need to help each other out in articulating, communicating and sharing what we identify to be the binds in which this world and, and the politics of it is, is structured. And then I think we need new forms of artistic expression that allow for the possibilities of imagining different kinds of futures. Decolonization asks for an implosion of sorts of the Western liberal democratic frame in order for a new form of human governance to arise. And I think that kind of thinking has to involve the arts. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of kind of incredible pockets of, of work across, across the African continent and, Afropolitism, which Ashil Mbembe writes so, so well about, that really kind of take us to a different world. I think AI can make us feel like we're stuck in this singular shared world of Ned Flanders, but seeing other worlds and imagining them and tasting them and getting a feel and taste is, is something that provokes new human feelings, takes us to new places and brings us, brings us forward. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, which I will almost certainly not answer in any satisfying way, but um, definitely in a way that maybe leads to more discussion. Um, when you talked about combining resistance with the higher ed question, um, my thought first went, the first kind of moment that I thought of was COVID, right? I mean, obviously, we were caught in a moment in which we all kind of were thrown back uh, onto these digital like or these digital technologies enabled a lot of coming together a lot of uh, actual education to continue to happen but one of the things that also happened here in Germany at least was that um, I was I was still at the university at the time <laughs> uh, we were all kind of frantically adapting to uh, teaching online and of course especially the the more senior professors were kind of refusing <laughs> and actually uh or kind of uh very reluctant to do so and they would rather um not teach or cancel their seminars than to get like a proper zoom um uh, introduction to zoom and to how do you how to actually make it accessible as a as a seminar space or as a space of learning and i think one of the things that we noticed was not only not only kind of this this resistance to change modalities of education um, to adapt to a certain situation of crisis, perhaps. But it was also really interesting that there were a lot of uh, people who actually really feared that AI or that, well, perhaps not necessarily AI in that moment, but that uh, these digital technologies and um, new formats that were emerging, such as, you know, uh, recorded talks and so on and so forth, that they would all uh, lead to a further 
kind of commodification of the teaching space in the sense of that the space itself is no longer a space of exchange, but rather a space, space in which, I don't know, knowledge is kind of distributed. And again, with this kind of understanding that, you know, um, I don't know, that you can replicate, for example, that you could replicate that lecture and uh, teach courses of a thousand students at once and things like that. So, so there was like this moment of resistance within the, the higher ed moment itself, which came actually from professors who were realizing and people who were who were kind of invested in, in student life itself, who were realizing that, you know, uh, and I think that this is true for, for the people studying labor relation, relations within AI as well, uh, and Rachel has gestured towards that, that, you know, um, the moment in which informal conversations or sort of the, the in, that learning has something to do with in-between spaces and that, um, you know, if we don't have these in-between spaces to come together, and like I said, Rachel has already said this and already put it very beautifully, if we don't have spaces to come together, um, there is no way of being together politically, right? So I think that having a, that like, that COVID was a moment in which many, many people recognized the classroom as a political space in which we could also talk about the very conditions that structure our learning. And um, to, to go into AI more specifically, I think that AI can also really help us to do exactly the work of showing, revealing, you know, if, for example, the um, the certainly now much talked about example of the hiring recruiting algorithm that Amazon had kind of deployed that was continuously degrading women. This is an this is a form of algorithmic bias that is you know when it appears in that way I think that um, it is a kind of it has a kind of it does have a kind of undeniability in the sense of that everybody kind of believes you know this. Uh, AI, these AI truths that emerge. So I think that there is another moment in which we could, um, and I guess that that this is the role of critique, right? That we can continuously observe the the realities that AI is producing, and um, with our knowledge of decolonial theory, of anti-racist theory, of gender theory, and all of the things that are kind of pertinent in the humanities or, or that, that are very important uh, paradigms within the humanities, they can allow us to understand what is actually happening when the technology kind of recedes into the background and is just leaving this supposed truth with us. Um, I think that another aspect, but this is really outside of the question of um, higher ed maybe a little bit is this aspect that that Rachel mentioned about about um catching up because I really think that the the whole idea of the stages I mean this is also a very very colonial idea you know of the stages of uh development the stages of so civil um uh, of, of so uh of, of civilization and so on and so forth and I think that the the, the very idea that there cannot be you know other modes of technology that circumvent perhaps the harmful ways and scales in which um, AI is currently being enacted. Um, I think that this is this is kind of the, the third moment of resistance, which is really just talking about the way that AI is already potentially impacting your life or um, potentially also not impacting your life because you are, for example, excluded from it. So I think there can be ways in which AI can help us think um, uh, certain certain um, things more clearly and understand uh, certain complexities and certain histories more clearly, uh, but never in the sense that we think they do. So always there is a kind of this um, the second stage of reflection that I think we need and that we need to all be trained in and that students need to be trained in and uh, to become uh, better engineers, uh, better coders, but also better critics of the situations in which they find themselves in. Yeah. I just want to say that we it's impossible to answer this question in five minutes, but I love both of your answers. They give us really concrete things that we kind of know what to do, how to do them. Uh, so uh, with that, I want to take an opportunity. We have like 10 minutes to, to uh, get folks from the audience to join us in conversation. Mary, I, uh, 
she so, you wrote a, a, a pronunciation, a way to pronounce it, but I still that doesn't mean anything to me. English is my second language, so I still mess it up. Yeah. Uh, no, right. my my Merve in Spanish. Marva. Oh, okay. Marva. Pretty close. Ma <laughs> cool. Oh, well, thank you, and, and thank you all for these. Um, well, for the thank you, um, Sarah and Rachel for the amazing talks, and Alex for like, getting us started with the um, the keynote. I guess I I have one of those. I have more of a comment than a question kind of a setting but I just kind of want to chime in on the conversation as someone who's um also like within the higher like I'm I'm doing a PhD at Stanford in history and also working with um an LP with text technologies specifically like with the um but with regards to Ottoman Turkish so I guess one one of the things that I realized hanging out with like like these um people within a part of the Stanford and LP network were actually sort of um, in so many cases, they either end up becoming the people who are developing these technologies or working for the people developing these technologies. So there's like a direct relationship that Stanford has built within this within this larger Silicon Valley tech that has a trickle down effect in the ways in which technology is developed all across. And one thing that I realized is there's a rising interest in understanding bias, understanding coloniality, understanding these broader um, concepts, these broader uh, critical approaches. But I do think that there are like certain um, sort of not everything gets communicated properly across these research barriers because I feel like in in so many instances what I've observed is but even when they talk about comparison in a CS setting in a computer science setting they talk about metrics they talk about like numbers and the idea of comparing two different settings. In a, in a humanistic manner seems very alien to them in so many ways. So I, I think one way to sort of address these, and I'm actually talking about my fellow graduate students, I'm not talking about faculty in this instance, maybe one way to sort of actually approach this is to create a, a conversation with, within the communities that are at, in these institutions and then be like, okay, yeah, look, this is how we do research in the humanities. When you want to talk about how the NLP community at UW developed differently from the NLP community at Johns Hopkins, you can actually compare them as from a humanistic perspective. There are methods to do that, like it's been around for centuries. And, and then the, um, okay, that, that was one of the points. So like, there's, there's, there's that. And then the other thing I think is very important is telling people, telling students, especially and teaching them what, how these models are built what they're good at and what they're not good at. I think there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding about what AI generated text really is. And there are like quintessential differences between the neural age and the pre-neural text development. And then even something like what is a black box algorithm, right? Like there are a lot of like discussions also within the community, but one of the things that is really, that I find really valuable is telling students how these models are built and the explainability of NLP, not the interpretability, which is like the engineering side, but the explainability, which is sort of also coming out of the University of Edinburgh, like NLP group, like these sort of like ideas about explaining what can we do with these technologies, what can we not do with these technologies. And there's a lot of sort of, yeah, so I think that that would be like my broader take, but yeah. Thank you, Marva. I think Marva's comment can be turned into a quite neat little question. Uh, with, which is I've noticed that when we say we need to explain AI, and, and we saw that right away, there was a rush to explain AI to communities. Uh, I myself participated in explaining uh, AI's work inner mechanisms uh, to brother my, my, my brother communities on social media uh, with the hope that they were not taken as oracular voices. So there were, in the beginning, I remember that the first moment a couple of years ago, we were like the rush to explain things was mostly so that because people were taking the word of God that was coming uh, down and even people who should know better. That's, that need to explain it in those terms has not left us. Uh, but now, obviously, in our conversation, we know that there's an easier to explain some other things about uh, AI inner workings, not just uh, that, that impulse to reduce the inner workings of AI just to the mathematical operations or the process of 
arriving at the large language models, uh, uh, it's, it, it's strong, but we know that we need to explain its labor costs. It's uh, uh, how the words themselves carry with them, uh, his, uh, culture and political and power, history of power and the planet. So we are an example in this conversation of how we're achieving other levels of explaining. Now, my, que my simple question to you is, uh, uh, are we gonna get talk in the explaining stage? Uh, or how do we, uh, it, given the need to continuously explain this, uh, how do we see uh, a way of building from out of the explanation? Uh, and I think Rachel, you 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 may have some comments because in the beginning, I imagine with the, some of the policy uh, folks, uh, you had to go through this stage of like first telling them, listen, this is not uh, you know, uh, this is concatenating words together, being a statistically derived after this. Uh. Yeah, we are going to continue having to explain AI. I think that's our responsibility, and I think that's our duty. Um, my my kind of issue or concern or worry here is that we've not found the language to talk to the people who are really bearing the cost of AI about these abstract systems that are hurting and harming them. So I'm less worried about the policymakers because it's their job to also figure it out. But I am worried that these gaps are widening as I'll, I'll continue to say. And that as we retreat, you know, the kind of thinking about the role of higher education, the role of the university, it's not to retreat into a discourse that doesn't um, transcend be outside, um, outside of the university. And, and I really do think that if we are to, to move ahead and make change, we need far more people demanding and asking for it. We need far more people with an opinion. We need far more people involved. We need far more people understanding the buying power they have to make decisions differently. Um, so, so yes, I think <laughs> explain AI is what we'll continue to do. <laughs> um, I can, there. yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know if I'm if I'm being annoyingly conceptual at the moment, but I think I mean, I think what I was doing yesterday uh, on Monday was in some way also explaining AI, but I was explaining it obviously very differently than people are potentially uh, used to. And I think that one of the points that I was maybe trying to make was that explaining it is very often part of the problem right because we have this kind of framing of that we think that we have to we have to like make sense and and of uh things that uh as we mentioned yesterday are not necessarily i mean in their in the, in the very technological sense not necessarily explainable and i think that this is partially because we don't have a a language on the social level but also because it's kind of like there is this confirmation bias that is ongoing right that we think um that you know correlation and causation are the same thing for example or that we think that you know certain um results are scalable uh in in a way that 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 they are not and um i think that really i mean and i mean this puts me in a bit of a predicament because i think that um this also shows how little like refusal in in the classical sense doesn't really work because i think we do have to know what's going on right in in the in the ecosystem and 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 understand how it works in the sense of what its effects are maybe much more than how it works in the sense of um like i can't really explain to you in pre with precision or in in technological detail how a car works but I still know how to use one, right? And I know how to use one without killing somebody. So <laughs> I think there are, you know, there, there are also, I think there's also, um, a, I think that very many AI applications that are, this is maybe another thing that the AI applications that are perhaps more community-based and more um, 
less toxic in the sense that we've been talking about are actually also not very spectacular, right? So I think this this the, this narrative of the spectacular is this other thing that is uh, that I think we have to really, really just get rid of in the sense that um, we should stop believe because it's been it's been an ongoing promise with every new technological turn, you know, that we will have kind of um, you, yeah that we'll finally have the global village connected, everybody will be, and what we're seeing is this global village is not as uh, peaceful and uh, we don't have all have the same opinion on things, right? So we also might not have the same um, understandings of to kind of bring in the previous questions, we might not have the same understanding of resistance, we might not have the same understanding of um, the, the level of harm that these technologies potentially do. And we might also not ever reach the same understanding of how to improve that technology. And I think that's something that we just have to deal with. And I'm just quickly looking at what Merva wrote. I'm thinking of explainability in the higher education setting along the lines of expected research works. Huh. Um, and how doing, and, and I think that this is what you're talking about, Merva, is the, the very core of media studies, not so much looking at um, how do they work on a technical level, but what are the effects of when these technologies are normalized? What are the effects on society, right? And I think this is something that we can, uh, that, that again, if more people and more diverse people do that work, I do think that it is, that it will be better, but I think uh, I am, I am like Rachel a, a little bit, um, people would maybe say pessimistic, but I think I'm actually op optimistic in the sense of that I think that we can demand for more. <laughs> I think we can want more from these technologies. And I think that, um, yeah, policy work that does not give um, techno technocrats like a free pass to do whatever the hell they want without any checks and balances in, uh, put in place, I think that is that is part one of the most important kind of impact factors that we have right and but i think um yeah i think that that on a on a more general level i also see a lot of i see a lot of dangers unfortunately i see the danger of you know or i see that the humanities are being increasingly underfunded or that you know in in Europe, uh, many of the humanities or digital humanities scholars need to kind of engage in private public partnerships just to get access to these technologies and thing. And I think that, um, you know, critical thinking is also something that has been deeply impacted by these technologies because we don't actually, uh, the, the kind of continuous uh, optimization of the, of the higher ed kind of universe has also led to a lack of you know, critical thinking and that that allows us to actually have the space and understanding to to criticize um, these technologies in, 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 a, in a proper way. And I think that this is something that comes to higher ed just as it came to the rest of the world in the sense that there is an increasing segregation, right? Because I think in the, you know, 150 years ago, the disciplines like the physicists and the artists, they were all together and the philosophers and so on and so forth. So I think interdisciplinarity is actually a way out of this. Um, but we have all, but we have all learned very, very different languages and methods and so on and so forth. So maybe, but this takes a lot of time because we don't actually understand each other across disciplines very often. So maybe I think fields like the digital humanities that take the serious this form of collaboration seriously as a critical form of collaboration, I think are really, really valuable in the sense that they do this work. It's slow work and it'll take a long time, but. I think that through this type of collaboration across disciplines, uh, we can really hope to find this new language that Rachel has been talking about. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I think that's a great way to end with the acknowledgement that I think we did a good job of understanding each other uh, across disciplines and domains. I, uh, I, I, I think a lot of that has to do with how generous both of you are and uh, the wonderful work uh, that you're doing that motivates us to want to to come together. Uh, I think there's a need to come together. And, I, and, and you're right. Uh, and Rachel is right. We have work to do. And I thank you both for giving us some concrete ways in which we can uh, do that work in, uh, in the years ahead.
Now, please, uh, I invite the audience to join me in, in thanking Rachel and Sarah for, for their wonderful uh, time, uh, comments and generosity.